Hi, and welcome to the Flipped Learning Network podcast. We are on the EdReach Network, where we're giving educators a voice, a big voice. And I am Joan Brown, your host today. Troy Cockrum is not with us this week. Uh, he's very busy getting ready for school, as many of us are. But I am here at a very inspirational Google Summit in Northern Virginia. We are in Falls Church, and um, we're on day two. And I have with me our keynote speaker from today. This is Christopher Kraft. Welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, Chris, I want you to tell our listeners a little bit about the background you have. Where do you teach? What do you do? Sure. I live, work, and play in Columbia, South Carolina. I teach sixth grade, and I absolutely love it. I teach a class called Introduction to STEM, which gives me the opportunity to work with kids on a wide variety of topics. It's a semester course, and it's a whole bunch of fun. Wow, I remember in your keynote you were talking about those sixth graders and you do a wonderful job in the keynote of relationship building with those students and the different kinds of personalities they have. Um, something that we will be reflecting on a lot as school gets started this year, making sure we make those first connections with them. But I think today we kind of wanted to focus on STEM, okay. since you are in a STEM-centered centered classroom. And many of us, I know in uh, my school district, Fairfax County, we have really suddenly just felt the wave of the interest in STEM, not just from our principals saying, hey, you need to be uh, teaching more related to science and tech, but also the community is begging for it. And so there are some teachers here that are, are nervous. They want to know what we need to get to get started. They want to understand what a STEM classroom looks like. Um, so why don't you tell me a little bit about your class? What are some of the things that you focus on? Sure. STEM is an interesting topic writ large because by all accounts, STEM shouldn't be a thing. Because if you look at science, technology, engineering, and math, let's just take the two bookends, they're very, very different and they come from very different epistemological standpoints. In a math class, if I don't come up with the right answer, then the math teacher will go back and hopefully kindly look through my work to determine where I messed up. In a science class, if I don't have the right answer, well then it, all it means is that if assuming the conditions were correct, that my hypothesis was wrong, or that the null hypothesis was proven. So they have very different epistemological standpoints. So I think we need to understand that as we get into STEM, because STEM has to be very fluid, very dynamic, and very, very full of motion when we do it. Uh, so to that end, we do, I think, so a lot of fun STEM work. I had a kid uh, about a year ago who was a migrant student and just always wanted to have a device in his hand. This was his goal. I would argue that I think most sixth graders at this point have gotten so inundated with should have and ought to have and go buy that the idea of having a device in the hand is not foreign to them. But for him, he began asking a little more critical questioning, things like, wouldn't it be great if this app did that? Wouldn't it be, why isn't there an app that does this? So I actually started him off with app development. We use a really neat tool called AppShed, developed uh, by some friends of mine that is, is designed for app development in education. And this little kid was able to successfully construct an app that, that had about a two-year run in the App Store. I, I took a look at that site and I'm incredibly impressed. I really need to take uh, a deeper look because that's a high interest mm -hmm. for students all across the board. One of the things you mentioned in your keynote was how many lower economic uh, status children actually do have a phone and um, so when you start talking about STEM and you talk about maybe app development, um, you're leveling a playing field right away, giving them an opportunity to use something that they actually have um, for a high, high level, high technical um, outcome. And real world, this is this mm -hmm. is what they want. This is what they understand. Um, the other little aspect, uh, I think, that you were talking about too, was reaching girls in a STEM world. Um, and we still talk about that difference between the, the girls that go into the science and math fields. And you mentioned one in your, in your keynote. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about her and how you reached her. There, there were two girls that I specifically talked about in the keynote, and I, there were two different ways that I reached her. Just for what it's worth, 
the I have two daughters, so the, the notion of reaching girls for STEM is one that's very personal because girls are very, very underrepresented in STEM fields. Uh, currently, it's, it's, it's on the order of about 20% of STEM graduates are female, and, and I think that's, uh, that's a woeful underrepresentation. Uh, one young lady, uh, so the overarching theme uh, to my talk is, is connecting with individual students. And one of the ways that I tried to connect with this particular student, uh, and each one of my students, by determining what their interests are, what drives them, what makes each, what makes each student tick. And this particular student was very, very interested in film and in cinema. And she would analyze film. And she would, you know, talk to her other friends about. And the conversations that I would overhear her having at lunch or, you know, in the hallways and just in, in informal opportunities was was more than just, hey, did you see this film? It was, well, why do you think this character did so and so? Or you know, why did so and so do this? And, you know, why didn't they do that? And why did they make these decisions? And it was, it was on a deeper level that I might have expected from a movie critic. So we actually, uh, there's a website called stemhollywood.com, uh, and it actually, it's Maya Bialik, who of course was Blossom when I was growing up, uh, and she's of course on The Big Bang Theory, mm -hmm. and she's a cognitive neuroscientist. She has a PhD in, uh, in neuroscience. So she goes to other scientists and interviews them on topics. For example, uh, one of our most popular episodes is her interviewing uh, an MD psychiatrist who teaches at the Harvard Medical School about zombies. And they talk through why zombies are the way they are and the parts of the brain are that, are, that are obviously affected by you know, the, the fact that the zombie is always hungry. You know, where's the hunger center of the brain? And you know, why is that never sa you know, why is that never satisfied? You know, the fact that zombies don't walk properly. You know, that's the amygdala because it's balanced and, and all of these different pieces. So that was a really neat way for me to connect with that one particular student. I'm, I'm glad you brought up zombies because um, we have done a podcast on zombies um, and how to bring pop culture into your classroom. And yeah. uh, we've also done another one on Star Wars and we're planning yet another one. So um, if you are doing the zombie theme, there's a video right there that will help out in your classroom. Fun. <laughs> um, and uh, I was thinking in terms of also, we have an initiative where we've changed the acronym STEM to STEAM, and I'm sure people have heard this, and that's bringing in our computer graphics. So um, I interviewed Ken Shelton, and he was our previous episode, and um, he has a background in uh, editing, photo editing, and of course video. And I'm seeing now that's another way to bring in some of those very visual students into a STEM environment. Um, do you do any more that uh, would incorporate video, for example? We'd like to. Uh, there's a lot that I'd like to, to integrate with. I actually work really closely with our visual arts teacher. So she makes sure that, that we're connecting, and we both make sure that we're connecting our curricula. So as we're talking through the, for example, take app development. App development requires more than a technical understanding of how to place this icon in, in this spot. I like AppShed for one reason. It integrates with Google Docs, so you can put a bunch of information there and then draw from it. But it's, it's not enough to make something that only functions properly. It also must look great. Mm -hmm. That's why you and I like certain apps, because of the visual appeal. Mm -hmm. Function is, of course, a, uh, critical. But visual appeal is also, I would argue, if not equally critical, right there close to it. Uh, I, I'm just, unfortunately, don't have enough time to work through. And truth be told, I don't know that I have that level of expertise. I'm good at the technical piece. I'm not good at the design piece. But thankfully, you're a great visual arts teacher, and we work very closely together so that students can kind of go back and forth between the curricula and have that cross-curricular opportunity to bring that A into, into the STEM program. I think that's that's key with uh, web development all around is that you got to partner with your graphic artists in the building and some of those are your students. Um, in Fairfax County we had a competition uh, to design what a 21st century learner looked like and this girl, uh, I believe she was a sixth grader, won the competition where she designed these Android type beings and they were amazing. The artwork was absolutely amazing and they all had symbolic representation of the types of ways that uh, learners are. So there you go. There's another way to, to bring it all together. Um, 
finally, I just I just want to say, you know, as far as the ed tech team that puts on the summits, um, how many of these do you go to usually in a year? How many do I travel yes. to in a year? Uh, somewhere on the order of 12 to 14 tops. Mm -hmm. uh, that fluctuates wildly because, uh, you know, a couple of years ago we were only running 10, 12, 15 summits. Mm -hmm. We're on track to run 54 in the next calendar year. So it presents wow. itself with more opportunities to travel, but you know, I'm certainly sensitive to balance that, you know, with family and home requirements and so sure. on. Sure. Are you planning on a trip someplace exciting in this year? Uh, well, I am fortunate to be keynoting the uh, summit in Hudson Valley, New York region that's coming up in, oh, in October. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, I was recently in Chile back in May doing a summit, so that was, uh, that was really wonderful. But uh, I, don't, I don't have any others that are on the books quite yet because they're, they're somewhat far out. But hoping to get to travel to some more exotic places. How do your, your southern references work in Chile? Uh, well, it was the <laughs> southern part of Chile. <laughs> So it's, uh, they trend. Thankfully, I speak Spanish, so it, you know I'm able to make uh, some slightly different jokes. But the sweet tea joke doesn't go. That over doesn't that go well. over. Oh. Uh, it, 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 it didn't go over well at all. All right. Well, I'm so glad you had the time uh, to chat with me. I, I realize it's short, but um, a lot of folks are going to be interested in STEM this year. They're going to want to uh, have some resources, and you've offered a few out that are that are key that are going to be helpful. Where can our listeners find you online? Uh, be, be, would love to interact with anybody that would be interested. I'm at Crafty184 on Twitter, or if you want to find my formal website, it's ChristopherCraft.com. There's a contact form at the very bottom. I would love to hear from you. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. And looking forward to the rest of this summit. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Chris.